everyone. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Richard, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and begin my intro. Good to go. Okay, great. All right, here we are, everybody. Welcome to Lunch with a Curator. My name is Jeff Sellers, and I'm the Director of Education at the Tennessee State Museum. And uh, this is very, very exciting. We're very excited to welcome you to the first uh, live streamed Lunch and Learn. Uh, we do live streaming at the museum, but this is the uh, uh, exclusively live streamed event. Uh, we're very excited to have you guys join us for this. Uh, it's been, always been a popular program at the museum. And so we thought, hey, we all should still have a lunch hour that we're doing. And we all uh, still love Tennessee history and sharing it and learning it. We've got a great group of uh, curators and educators at the museum uh, who can who can deliver some great Tennessee history. So why don't we keep it up? And uh, so every Wednesday at 12 o'clock, we'll meet right here and uh, we'll invite uh, one of our curators to give a talk on a Tennessee topic of their choosing. It could be a historical topic, it could be a particular part of our collection, or it could be a little bit of, a, of, of both. Um, we'll feature uh, different graphics and artifacts from our collection. So I hope you have your lunch. I, I have my lunch that I'll be uh, snacking on during the time. So um, uh, looking forward to getting started. Before we do get started, let's go over a few quick tips for WebEx. Uh, many of you are probably used to using Zoom, uh, but this is a, a very similar platform that the state uses. First and foremost, uh, you are all, all on mute. We all know the value of that mute button in today's uh, video conferencing world. So don't worry about your dogs or your kids or anything like that. You'll, uh, you should be muted through the, uh, through the duration. However, um, the second feature is, uh, is important to you and we want you to use it. It's that chat button. If you scroll your cursor down to the bottom of your, your screen there, you'll see the chat button. It's just a text bubble. Uh, and if you click on that, it'll bring up the chat box to the right. We want you to type in your questions. We want this to be interactive with you. So type those questions in for our curator. And uh, at the end of the program, we will um, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Program should last about 30 to 45 minutes and we'll just see how far we can go and get during that time. Uh, let's see, now I think we're ready to, I think that's all logistics. Oh, one other thing, we do have a tech, uh, a tech person, so to speak, that is here joining us, Mamie Hassel. If you do have any questions, just type it into that tech, text box and Mamie, uh, who uh, is very experienced in WebEx, can help you out with anything you might need. All right, I guess that's all I got for housekeeping tips. Uh, let's bring on today's curator, our very first curator, i.e. our very first guinea pig to, uh, to do this program with us is, uh, is a great colleague of ours. It's, uh, his name is Mr. Richard White, and he is the curator of 18th and 19th century history at the museum. He specializes in military history and its material culture. He's going to bring us a talk about a blog post he re recently wrote. Uh, you can find it on our stories page at tmmuseum.org. It's entitled Shiloh, A Reflection Through Artifacts. And Richard is going to kind of talk about his personal journey through learning and researching this uh, very important battle in the state's history. So Richard, uh, if you're ready, I think we can take it away with our very first lunch with a curator. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to, into my home. Uh, we're all sort of struggling right now with working from home, but uh, as Jeff said, we wanted to still be able to connect with you guys and bring you some content. Uh, so this sort of came as an outgrowth of the blog post uh, that I we put up last week, and it was basically sort of a reflection on Shiloh through artifacts and how I came to that. Honestly, uh, I've been a Tennessee native my whole life. Uh, generally, almost every spring, I take a trip down to Shiloh around the anniversary of the battle. And uh, it's a great time to go. Um, you know, everything is blooming out in spring. Plus, you can see the battlefield the way that the soldiers and commanders saw it uh, on those early April days in 1862. Um, so I sort of looked at, through the blog, how my relationship 
um, had changed with the battlefield over time from being a little kid to then being more like a teenager and then finally um, <clears throat> as an adult and more of looking at it as more of a historian. Uh, but today I wanted to look at it a little bit differently again. Uh, so today we're going to kind of reflect on basically sort of a stair step up through the army uh, as we look at Shiloh. And um, I will tell you, we're not going to go overly detailed on tactics and troop movements and things like that. Um, but we're going to sort of start out with a common soldier. Then we're going to take a step up to the regimental level. Uh, and then we're going to take another step up to that sort of command level of like a general officer. Um, but I wanted to give you guys uh, just a little bit of context and background here for Shiloh, how these armies end up at Shiloh, and sort of where we are in the Civil War at that point. Uh, so the Battle of Shiloh will take place uh, April 6th and 7th of 1862. Uh, so the anniversary was at the beginning of the month here. But by that point, the war is almost a year old. Uh, you've had a couple of sort of large battles, but nothing on the scale that Shiloh will be. And uh, that's one of the things, I think it's such an important battle. Uh, it's one of the most major battles that took place in our state. But over the course of two days, uh, you have a combined 24,000 casualties, and that's killed, wounded, uh, missing, and captured. Um, that casualty total amounts to more casualties in a single event than it happened in all of the American wars up to that point combined. You think of the American Revolution, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, uh, you're gonna have more casualties in two days at Shiloh than you had in all of those wars combined. Um, Shiloh is also in a very isolated place. So it's one of the first instances during the Civil War where you have large scale field hospitals that are put into place uh, for triage close to the battlefield before these troops can be moved to the nearest town, which was Savannah, Tennessee, almost nine miles away. Uh, but early in the war, the uh, Union war effort is basically to uh, create an incursion into Tennessee um, by the avenue of the Tennessee River or the Cumberland River, or both. And the reason for that is Tennessee has constructed, the state of Tennessee has constructed two large fortifications, Fort Henry and Fort Donelson, that are located on those rivers. Uh, there's not a great defensive line extending uh, to the east past uh, Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. In fact, it's up in Kentucky. So it's sort of a tenuous line. But those forts anchor the whole line. And if those forts fall, it's going to push that whole line back further towards the south. Um, so an upcoming Union commander named Ulysses S. Grant, I'm sure we've all heard of that guy, uh, he's going to take um, a combined Army and Navy expedition and take Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson early in February, 1862. Uh, he captures about 13,000 Confederate soldiers at Fort Donaldson. So that's 13,000 men that the Confederate Army is not gonna have for any kind of counterstroke uh, like they're gonna try to mount at Shiloh. <clears throat> so Nashville Falls following the fall of Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, and that whole Confederate line is pushed way further in down towards the south. Uh, and in fact, when Nashville is evacuated, a lot of those troops begin congregating in northern Mississippi and in northern Alabama. Um, so the overall Confederate commander is General Albert Sidney Johnston, and he does start concentrating all the troops that he can pull from all over the south, basically, at Corinth, Mississippi. Uh, Corinth is a major railroad hub at the time. Uh, farmers can bring their produce to market there, then it can be railroaded to Memphis or even uh, to get to the Mississippi River for trade further north, or it can be transported back further to the east. Um, so even in 1862, Corinth, Mississippi is an important place, and that is the target of Grant moving further down the Tennessee River. So once Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson fall, he moves to Pittsburgh Landing, uh, which is in the southwest part portion of our state, uh, and Pittsburgh Landing is generally the area where the Battle of Shiloh will take place. Early on, it was sometimes called the Battle of Pittsburgh Landing. Uh, but it's basically a landing on the river with a few buildings uh, and a road network that radiates from um, that uh, river landing. And that's, those are road networks for farmers to bring their poters to the river to get it on steamboats going down the river too. So Grant, and uh, there's elevated flat areas where Grant can camp uh, large portions of his army. So they're camped there, and the reason why they've sort of halted at Pittsburgh Landing, they're waiting for another federal army 
who arrived from Nashville. Uh, General Don Carlos Buell's army is marching rather slowly uh, to link up with Grant down in southwestern Tennessee, and then those combined armies are going to make a push toward Corinth. Um, so Grant's sort of resting his army and waiting there. The Confederate response is they're going to try to counterattack Grant along that river there uh, in order to sort of throw back some of these Union advances. Um, I'm now going to share my screen with you guys, and we're going to sort of start. I'm going to show you some images and things. But the uh, the first image you see here is basically sort of a kind of generic uh, map of the first day's battle at Shiloh. But just to give you guys some context, um, and here you can see Grant's army is going to be camped out in a lot of these fields where you see my cursor going. The battle lines that you see established were sort of established on the fly that morning of the 6th when the Confederates attacked. But basically, Johnston's plan for the Confederate Army is what he's trying to do, and you see the arrows kind of swoop into the right there. He's trying to push Grant's army away from the river and back them up on Owl Creek here. And if you see, the field is sort of triangulated. You have Owl Creek, then you have the Tennessee River. So he's trying to bottle Grant's army up in here, and what he's thinking is if Owl Creek is flooded at the time, so if he can push them up against Owl Creek, he can possibly get the entire army to surrender. Um, so the, the attacks are a bit disjointed during the day, but a couple of uh, things I wanted to point out to you guys here on this map for context for you as we move along. Um, here is Shiloh Church. and You can see that sort of where I'm circling. Um, other than farms and barns that were located on the battlefield, Shiloh Church is one of the only like official buildings that's there. So it'll be a landmark. Uh, another place to keep an eye on is the hornet's nest here. Um, one set of artifacts we're gonna talk about, uh, one of those soldiers was involved in the fighting there around the hornet's nest. Um, so the Confederates surprise attack that morning, the uh, Federal Army did have a little bit of warning that there was a large body of Confederates nearby. Um, but throughout the day, they're gonna mount some pretty stubborn resistance as the Confederates try to push back. Uh, so the hornet's nest sort of becomes um, a, a stronghold for the Union Army, and they're ordered to hold out as long as they can there, while Grant is basically creating another line back up here uh, that's sort of parallel to the Hamburg-Savannah Road with massed artillery. Now, the night of the first day, once everything settles down, uh, late in the afternoon of the first, General Johnston for the Confederate uh, Army is mortally wounded, uh, and he will bleed out on the battlefield. So command goes to General PGT Beauregard. Uh, and so the attacks become a little disjointed because you don't have that command cohesion and things sort of settle down for the night. Well, overnight, uh, Grant is gonna bring gunboats up into the Tennessee River that will shell the Confederate positions all through the night. And Buell's army from Nashville begins to arrive. So overnight, Buell's army is uh, transported across the Tennessee River and in the morning, Grant has major reinforcements. So the Battle of Shiloh basically goes, the first day goes one direction, the second day goes almost exactly the opposite. So Grant has all these reinforcements and his army is gonna attack south and push the Confederate army almost all the way back uh, to Corinth, Mississippi. So that's sort of Battle of Shiloh in a nutshell there, um, really quick. And now I wanna to transition to talking about some artifacts that are in our collection. And uh, all the images that I'll show you here, I will say are not necessarily from the collection and I'll try to highlight which ones are and aren't, but I pulled some others from internet images just to give you guys some context for what we're talking about. Um, but what I sort of decided to do here is like I said earlier, we're gonna take this kind of step up uh, through how soldiers and regiments and commanders experience this battle. And so uh, the first person that we want to focus on is a gentleman named James Barkley Rosser. And uh, the letter you should now see there on your screen was written by James Barkley Rosser to his sister, Elizabeth Rosser, on April 7th, 1862. So he's writing this letter the night of the second day of the battle. Now, uh, Rosser's regiment is the Louisiana Crescent Regiment. So I do apologize, he's not necessarily a Tennessean, but we have this fantastic letter in the collection. It's actually a battle letter, we call it, because he is recounting uh, what he did over the last couple days uh, during the Battle of Shiloh. So 
So we'll come back to that letter here in just a second. But uh, keep an eye on that. You've got a, a stationary heading up there that says Onward to Victory and a representation of Lady Liberty carrying the American flag. Uh, so James Barker Rosser is a member of the Crescent Regiment, which was recruited in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1861. And it eventually, it carried the name of the Crescent Regiment for uh, about a year throughout the war. And finally, they're designated the 24th Louisiana Infantry. But they do, they do still carry that Crescent Regiment nickname throughout. Now, this is an unidentified soldier from that regiment. So uh, again, I apologize, it's not a picture of Rosser, but this is uh, generally what a Confederate soldier would have looked like in 1861 and 1862. Uh, we know that he is in a Louisiana regiment. I'm gonna zoom in here for you because his belt buckle is the Louisiana State Pelican belt buckle. Uh, so this gives you an idea of what Rosser's companions and comrades in his regiment would look like that day at the Battle of Shiloh. Um, and at this point in the war, most of those Confederate soldiers still had very nice, uh, fully outfitted uniforms. This was before you sort of got into the more uh, ragged Confederate later in the war. Now the next image here is for you guys to see sort of the area that Rosser and his regiment were fighting in. We'll zoom in a little bit on that. Um, this is a rather famous and popular lithograph that is used in association with Shiloh in a lot of sources and publications. Um, but it is called the Hornet's Nest, and it was done by uh, an artist named Tor de Thulstrup in 1888. Um, but Rosser's Crescent Regiment is going to be involved in the fighting at the Hornet's Nest. And in fact, he will be, his regiment will be involved in the surrender of his command. Uh, there at the hornet's nest late in the afternoon of the first day of the battle. So a couple things to point out to you here. The hornet's nest, um, Shiloh is a very wooded battlefield, but at the time of the war you had farms, so they had these nicely manicured fields that were great fields of fire for infantrymen and artillery. The uh, hornet's nest you can see was more wooded, and that's probably one of the reasons why they were able to hold out longer during the day, because they were so well dug in. But uh, this is the sunken road that they used basically as the establishment of their line. And the gentleman you see here on the horse is generally listed as Grant. And we have documentation that Grant at least visited the Hornet's Nest line one time during the afternoon, uh, explaining to Prentice that he was creating a new line and he was hoping that Prentice could hold out for as long as possible. Um, so let's go back, uh, look at our letter here. And I do wanna read you guys, um, an excerpt from Rosser's letter. And you'll notice uh, this is a different page of the letter and he's got a different uh, stationary stamp there at the top. So part of the material culture wrapped up in this letter, which I think is very interesting, is uh, the Civil War was one of the first booms in the production of mass scale stationary for people because you had all these troops. The average soldier had never traveled more than 10 miles from his home in his life. So they're all going off on what they see as this great adventure. And the letter writing, um, because the population is so literate at the time, the letter writing is fantastic. And uh, voluminous um, communication between soldiers and family at home. Uh, so you start seeing the rise. Sutlers would sell the stationary soldiers uh, in camp. They had some form of a patriotic theme attached to them. So I'm not going to read you guys the entirety of the letter here. And in fact, I've left out uh, some of his experiences of the actual battle. Um, do it. What I'm kind of highlighting here is uh, this is a test. And sure enough, here I am. I'm pulling, uh, sorry guys, I'm getting a lot of feedback from somebody else on here. You do it. But basically, we're going to go through uh, the letter, and there'll be some parts where I've left out things that talk directly about the battle. But what we're looking at basically is Rosser's experience, the experience of him being a guy on the firing line. What do you mean? Watch? What'd you watch? The struggles that he went through uh, what is throughout that? the battle there. So uh, again, this letter was what written April seventh. I'm trying to turn this battle. thing down, and I and I don't know how. <laughs> It is after uh, Rosser's 
regiment has retreated to Corinth and oh, he's actually okay. in his tent there writing this letter. You know, like in all of Nashville, I am the only attendee. There are three panelists and one attendee and I'm the only one that's ever in. Sorry guys, I'm picking up a lot of uh, conversation from some people on here. For those of you who are joining us on the Zoom, just know that we do not have the ability to mute you. So anything that you are saying over the phone, everyone can hear you. Those of you who are joining via computer, you are muted. But if you're joining us via phone or tablet, I do not have the ability to mute you, so please do be aware that everyone can hear what you are saying. So just be aware of that going forward. That's why we're having a little bit of feedback issues. Sorry, Richard, go ahead. No, I just wanted to make sure everybody could still hear me. So again, these are some excerpts from the Rosser letter. Uh, and towards the end there, it'll give you kind of the coup de grace about the stationery he's writing on here. Um, but his letter is written over the course of a couple of days, and it's actually a pretty epic letter. He's written on like two pieces of stationery for a six page letter, uh, which is pretty long by Civil War terms. Uh, but he starts the day before the battle begins. So up next morning before daylight, and then we marched through rain and mud nearly all day and camped in about four miles from the enemy's camp. Heard their drums beating that night. It was very cold and we were not allowed to build any fires and not even to speak aloud to one another. We were then out of provisions as it is impossible to carry more than two days rations in our haversacks. I had a piece of cracker and cup of coffee without sugar for my breakfast. My feet blistered so badly I could scarcely walk. We were put in motion then on Sunday morning early to meet the enemy. This is the day of the battle. And we're skipping ahead a little bit because he's gonna talk about getting to the battlefield. Uh, we then made a flank movement and caused General Prentice's command to surrender to our regiment. And he's talking about that fighting around um, the hornet's nest there. Colonel Smith received his sword. During all this engagement, I was so sick and my feet so sore, I could hardly keep up. And we all threw away our blankets when going into the fight. The ground was covered with things of all descriptions. We had to sleep in their filthy tents, and I got wet being near the opening where the rain came in. Besides, the tents were full of bullet holes and the, came, the rain came right through anyhow. My feet were so wet and I was completely worn out. The Yankees had in their tents every luxury and comfort, lots of provisions of every imaginable kind. We supplied ourselves with oilcloths, overcoats, shoes, hats, etc. I ate some cheese and sardines and oysters that they had, and I am writing with one of their pencils on their paper. Uh, so I think that's sort of an interesting thing in his letter there. The Confederate regiments did overrun a lot of Union camps that first day of the battle. Uh, so it appears that Private Rosser there uh, captured him some stationery and a pencil, as well as some other things, so he could write this letter home to his sister. Uh, he did manage to survive the war, and we have a couple of other uh, letters in the collection that don't deal necessarily with battles, uh, but deal more with just uh, talking and catching up with family members. Uh, I do want to show you guys the next slide here. Uh, this is the Louisiana Crescent Regiment Monument at the Battle of Shiloh, and or at the Shiloh National Military Park, excuse me. And um, the monument was one of the first Confederate monuments that was placed on the field. And we'll see a little bit later on the first monument. But here you've got, there's always um, a lot of meaning in the monuments you see on battlefields. So here's the large crescent moon. Uh, which was a symbol of a lot of those Louisiana regiments. And of course, Shiloh is dotted with monuments for Union and Confederate uh, units that fought there on the battle. So uh, we've seen Private Rosser, and he was clearly very concerned about the condition of his feet and being able to keep up on the march. And that, of course, is a concern for any infantryman when you're going on campaign. Uh, and it's often difficult, and especially with the type of shoes they had in the Civil War, to maintain your feet through those uh, types of engagements. So the next we're gonna move on, we're gonna take a step up to the regimental level. And uh, what you see on your screen there is uh, the first national pattern battle, uh, battle flag of the 2nd Tennessee Volunteer Infantry. Uh, 
The second Tennessee, based on their numerical designation, was in fact the second regiment raised in the state. Uh, they were organized and uh, mustered in Nashville in May of 1861. And then they were almost immediately transferred to Virginia. Uh, er that early in the war, the seat of the war was in Virginia. Um, so they were transferred up there with the first uh, Tennessee infantry as well. And they were present at the Battle of Bull Run or First Manassas, but they were held in reserve. So they didn't participate in the battle. And shortly after that, things started ramping up out here in the Western theater uh, with Union incursions into Southern states. So those, um, the first and the, the second were transferred back to Tennessee to become part of Albert Sidney Johnston's growing army there at Corinth. Uh, but when they're sent back, and we'll come back to the flag here in a minute, because we're gonna talk a little bit more in depth about that. But when they're brought back into Johnston's army of the Mississippi, they're gonna be brigaded with Patrick Renane Claiborne. And uh, anybody who has any basic knowledge of the Civil War knows Claiborne is a pretty famous and pretty popular general on the Confederate side, especially out here in the Western theater. Uh, but the image you see there is a pastel portrait that was done by S. Waters in 1895 that is part of the museum collection. Um, Claiborne was a native of Ireland and he had been uh, in the British Army uh, prior to coming to the United States. And so he had that experience of knowing uh, what it was like to train, being in the very rigid British, British Army. Um, so when he joins, he's pretty quickly elected to colonel of an Arkansas regiment and will eventually be promoted to Brigadier General. Um, now he does a decent job on the first day at Shiloh, but uh, Claiborne's brigade is gonna attack an area around Shiloh Church um, that is defended by William T. Sherman's division and uh, they get sort of roughed up there early in the morning. There's pretty concerted Union stand. And Claiborne's command is also divided by a large swampy area that won't allow the brigade to pass through as a solid unit. So they have to sort of break up and go around that. Uh, but the second Tennessee is gonna be part of Claiborne's brigade there at the Battle of Shiloh. And their regimental commander should be on your screen now. Uh, his name is William Brimage Bates. And uh, Bate will be in command of the 2nd Tennessee at the Battle of Shiloh. He is a native of Sumner County, Tennessee, and he is a Mexican-American war vet uh, serving with the 3rd Tennessee Infantry down in Mexico. Uh, but when he comes back from the Mexican War, he's elected to the Tennessee House of Representatives, and he will eventually be appointed the Attorney General of Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, so when the war breaks out, um, Bate's one of those that doesn't appear to have used his political influence or family influence to gain a commission. He actually enlisted as a private uh, in the second Tennessee, but he's pretty quickly elected to be Colonel of the regiment. Uh, so on the morning of April 6th, oh, and I will mention when the second Tennessee is mustered into service in May of 1861, they have right around a thousand men. Uh, on the morning of April 6th, 1862, so less than a year, uh, Bate will take 365 combat effectives into the Battle of Shiloh. So that shows you the attrition that can happen in those regiments, even when you're not participating in major battles. So a lot of those guys go home from being sick. They go home from being worn out, like Private Rosser we talked about. Some of those guys couldn't make it, and uh, other ones were able to soldier on. Um, but sickness, injury, it just depletes the numbers of those regiments uh, very quickly. Let's come back to our flag now. Um, this is a first national pattern flag. So this was the first uh, flag adopted by the Confederate States. And early in the war, it was used as a battle flag. Uh, but one thing you may notice there, and it was a problem with the flag, is it looks an awful lot like the American flag. Same colors and same general layout, except less stripes. So on a battlefield, if you didn't have any wind and that flag is hanging limp on the flagpole there, it could be mistaken for an American flag. Uh, so the Confederate government pretty quickly adopts the St. Andrew's Cross battle flag, which is the uh, X, the one that we're most familiar with these days, considered the Confederate flag. But a lot of the regiments early in the war were carrying these first national pattern flags. Uh, now, one thing you may notice first off is there's a lot of stars on this flag. Um, there's 15 to be exact. And 11 states uh, seceded from the Union and formed the Confederate States of America. Uh, but especially early in the war, um, the Confederate regiments and the home front, they like to take credit for the other states that they felt should be in the Confederacy. 
So Tennessee is a divided state. You do have union, uh, unionist elements here in the state, but a couple other divided states, uh, Kentucky was divided and they're generally considered to be a slave state and they tried to remain neutral at the beginning of the war. And Missouri is also a predominantly slave state uh, that remains in the union. So two of those stars are counting Missouri and Kentucky, and the other two are counting uh, Delaware and Maryland, which were also both predominantly slaveholding states, uh, but did not in fact secede from the Union. So you got 15 stars there uh, with four extra from the ones that actually formed the Confederacy. But this flag was presented to the regiment in May of 1861 in Nashville, Tennessee, by a Mrs. Matilda Morgan Cheney and several other ladies is what the newspaper article said. Uh, based on the history that we have of this flag, it only flew at the Battle of Shiloh. And there were at least two flags present at, the Sh at Shiloh with the 2nd Tennessee Infantry. And sometimes flags were used on the end of the regiment as guides, as well as in the middle um, for that purpose of guiding too. But what you guys see there is the thing within a regiment that is an inanimate object but it is almost the lifeblood of the regiment. If you take it away from a living person, this is gonna be one of the most important things to those 365 uh, Tennessee guys. They look um, and they're proud of their flag and eventually they will put battle honors on the flag for battles that they've participated in so that other regiments can know the service history that they've had up to that point. Uh, the men would protect the flags with their lives there was always another color bearer who would pick up the flag if it went down. Um, so this flag uh, flew over the regiment during the Battle of Shiloh. And uh, it has sort of an interesting little history with it too. Uh, there in the early afternoon, Colonel Bate is grievously wounded. Um, he takes a musket ball to his leg and he's taken to the hospital and the flag goes to the hospital with him. Well, at the hospital, the surgeon says all they can do is amputate the leg to save his life. Well, uh, Bate produces his pistol and threatens the surgeon's life if he amputates his leg. Uh, so Bate kept his leg, and he actually had problems with that leg for the rest of his life, a pretty significant limp, but he did not have to have it amputated. Uh, but Bate came back to uh, Middle Tennessee to recuperate, and he put this flag with the Lytton family of Middle Tennessee, and the Lytton family kept it uh, for safekeeping purposes until after the war. And eventually it was turned over to the Tennessee Historical Society and became part of our collection. But those regimental flags are really the lifeblood of the regiments uh, on the battlefield. And it gives them something to look to as a guide. <sighs> and so now as we proceed on here, um, the uh, postcard you see here was one of the earliest postcards produced after the original military parks associated with the Civil War were created in the late 1890s. So this postcard from the early 1900s sort of illustrates the beginning of a tourism industry related to those battlefields. But I did want to show it because it shows the Shiloh Meeting House. And uh, like I said, other than farmhouses and barns, this is one of the only official structures on the battlefield. And as you can see, it's, it's very official. Uh, it's a four-sided log cabin uh, there was a meeting house um, for Methodists in the area. And if you go to Shiloh now, there's a reconstructed cabin that's in the same location as that one. And there's a rather uh, large sized cemetery there that surrounds the church. And uh, former Tennessee Governor Ray Blanton is actually buried in that cemetery there on the Shiloh battlefield. But that just gives you sort of an idea that 2nd Tennessee Regiment was attacking towards Shiloh Church. So that image you see there would have been a landmark that they would have been familiar with on that first day of the battle. Uh, and then we have another postcard that's from that early period. And I wanted to show you this one, uh, blow it up there for you a little bit. This is the second Tennessee monument that was placed on the battlefield at Shiloh. And this was the first uh, Confederate monument placed on the field at Shiloh. Uh, so it was dedicated in 1903 and they raised funds by Veterans of the regiment um, had subscription cards and they would subscribe to pay a certain amount towards the monument. So uh, it is dedicated in 1903 and it has a really neat quote at the bottom of it that when I was younger, uh, being a native Tennessee, it had always kind of stirred something in me. But down there at the base of the monument and there's at the top, it's adorned with uh, just a, 
Confederate infantryman who looks like he's ready to go into battle. Uh, but the quote there at the bottom says, go stranger and tell Tennesseans that here we died for her. Uh, and so the flip side of the postcard there you can see is the Louisiana Crescent Monument. And those were two of the first, uh, well, the first, the second Tennessee was the first monument. And the Crescent Monument may have been the second, but they're highlighting two of the earliest monuments placed on the field there. So we've looked at private roster. We've looked at the next step up was just the regiment and private roster would have been part of that regimental community. So now let's turn our attention to more of the uh, command level of the army or like a general. Uh, so the sword you guys see here is um, a pretty standard sword in terms of uh, Civil War armaments. It is a model 1860 cavalry saber. And this sword actually replaced the model 1840 cavalry saber. And that model 1840 had uh, the unfortunate nickname of the wrist breaker. It was a large dragoon sword that was very heavy and very unwieldy on horseback. So in 1860, right before the war begins, the federal government adopts a new model uh, saber. And this one's a little bit more streamlined. It doesn't weigh nearly as much and fully replaces the wrist breaker as the issued uh, sidearm of cavalry. Um, it's less heavy, it's more functional. Now, there are types of swords generally that officers carried called field and staff officer swords, but a lot of high ranking officers preferred the cavalry saber because it did have a little bit more heft to it, felt like you were carrying a bit more of a significant weapon. And of course, um, cavalry troops use these in uh, battle circumstances, fighting. General officers generally use their swords to direct troops on the battlefield. Uh, and you could always see the officer there waving the sword above his head. So this, uh, the swords you guys see there, I don't wanna reveal everything quite yet, but the swords you see there was on the battlefield at Shiloh. Uh, the gentleman you see here in the next image is uh, Major General George H. Thomas of the US Army. Um, Thomas was present at the Battle of Shiloh. He comes in as part of the reinforcements that arrive overnight with Buell's army. Uh, but Thomas is a native Virginian. Uh, so when Virginia secedes from the Union, Thomas chooses to stay loyal to the Union. And this caused such a rift within his family uh, that his sisters actually took his portrait and turned it around towards the wall. So he was facing the wall and apparently the portrait was never turned back around. Uh, so he never really was able to reconcile with his family. But Thomas will become one of the most successful Union generals. And at the Battle of Shiloh, his career ascending in that direction has already begun. Uh, he has won the first major Union victory in the Western Theater at the Battle of Mill Springs in Kentucky in January of 62. So just a couple months before the Battle of Shiloh. But he turned back a Confederate force that was trying to occupy a portion of Kentucky. Um, so Thomas is generally sort of touted early in the war as kind of a hero when the Union war effort was looking for heroes that they could find. Uh, the photograph you see here was actually taken in 1863 in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. But the lithograph you see here, and it's kind of dark, and I do apologize for that, but it's meant to be a night scene. So we're going to come in a little bit on it. Uh, but this is the scene that would have greeted Thomas at Shiloh Landing on the night of April 6, 1862. Uh, you can see the side of a large steamboat here, and the decks are just crowded with hundreds of Union soldiers. And the uh, Buell's Army of the Ohio had marched to an, a point opposite Pittsburgh Landing right across the river, and they were using these steamboats to ferry the troops across the river and uh, unload up the landing there. Um, this is actually one of the first stops if you go tour the Shiloh battlefield. So if you've been down there, you're familiar with where this image was taken. But that's sort of what would have greeted Thomas that night when he arrived on the battlefield. And a lot of Union troops during the day had become disorganized and had been pushed back towards the river. And there were supposedly thousands of Union uh, shirkers kind of um, cowering down there on the bluffs as these fresh troops came in. And it did sort of give uh, them a little bit of confidence to maybe try to go relocate their regiment. Well, let's come back around to our sword here. And uh, the big reveal here is that this sword belonged to Major General George H. Thomas. And uh, oftentimes officers will have several different swords. Um, they are presented swords by their troops. 
for different occasions or different anniversaries. And those are really fancy, elaborate, generally engraved swords. But the one you're seeing here was General Thomas's functional sidearm throughout the Civil War. Uh, it was made by Ames Manufacturing Company of Massachusetts, and he purchased it almost immediately following the Battle of Mill Springs. And we were recently able to acquire this sword, uh, and we consider it to be one of our star effects, uh, one of our really important artifacts. But it's on display in the Battle of Nashville case because there's a little bit more of a feature about Thomas there because Thomas commanded the Union Army at the Battle of Nashville. Uh, but we have great provenance on this sword, and there's a couple of engravings on it. Um, right here on the back of the counter guard where you're seeing me point, uh, Thomas actually had the sword engraved when he ordered it from Ames. So engraved there on the top side of that is George H. Thomas, U.S. Army. Uh, then on the, uh, the cap back here on the end, after the war, Thomas never had any children. So on his staff was his nephew named Sanford Kellogg. And at the end of the war, uh, Thomas presented this sword to Sanford Kellogg as sort of a memento of his service during the war and his faithful service to Thomas. So uh, Kellogg had it engraved on the back of the cap here. Uh, and it says, this saber was used by General Thomas all through the Civil War and presented to Colonel Sanford C. Kellogg, U.S. Army. Uh, so the documentation, we know specifically of three swords that Thomas owned uh, at the time of the Civil War, and this is the one that he carried. So this was present on the battlefield at Shiloh. Uh, Thomas's troops were basically held in reserve on the second day, they were not really needed, but they did deploy on the battlefield and were ready to advance uh, if they were needed. But Thomas, from this point on, Thomas will ascend in the Union pantheon of high-ranking generals. And by the end of the war, in, in my opinion, He's sort of right there behind Grant and Sherman as being some of the most successful uh, generals of the war. Uh, he'll command the Army of the Cumberland for almost the remainder of the war. And like I said, he's in command of that army at the Battle of Nashville, which the Battle of Nashville is generally considered to be one of the most well-orchestrated battle plans of the Civil War. Uh, the plan that Thomas laid out was just executed perfectly there. So as we come back to our image of Thomas, uh, there's plenty of pictures of him floating around out there uh, that he had taken of himself during the war. This is the only one that has the sword in it. Um, so that sword there you see is the one that I just showed you that is part of the museum collection. And again, this image was taken uh, in Murfreesboro in June of 63. But Thomas had had the sword for more than a year before that. Uh, but it is the one that he carried for the rest of the war. And if you're familiar with the Battle of Chickamauga, he earned his nickname there, the Rock of Chickamauga, by holding Snodgrass Hill. So I always imagine that that sword was probably used by Thomas rallying those troops on Snodgrass Hill that day. So let me get out of sharing my screen with you guys here. Um, so that uh, sort of shows you basically a stair step up from a private soldier in the ranks who's complaining about being cold and throwing his blanket away and his feet just absolutely killing him uh, to a regiment. And the regiment was the backbone of the army. That was the community within the community. Uh, those were guys that you were familiar with from your hometown and from your neighborhood. Uh, and then we take that final step up to General Thomas, who is a general officer. Uh, and we had that fantastic sword um, that we have now in the collection. Uh, I'm about to turn it back over to Jeff, and we're going to open it up for a few questions here. I do want to recommend, since we're all at home, well, most of us at least, at home, working from home, we have a lot more time on our hands. Lately, there has been um, some great scholarship that's come out about Shiloh. So I wanted to recommend a couple of books to you guys. Uh, the first one here, hopefully you can see that on your screen, um, is a history and guide to the monuments of Shiloh National Military Park. And it's by Stacy Reeves. Uh, it's a paperback, so not a huge price point there. But this gives you a great history of the monumentation on the battlefield. And through that, you learn a history of the park and the commemoration that went on there. And it's got sections on the history of the battle too. Uh, now, another book that came out just last year, uh, it's part of the Emerging Civil War series through Savas Beatty Press. Uh, 
Uh, it's titled Attack at Dawn and Whip Them, which was a, a quote from Albert Sidney Johnston. But the Battle of Shiloh, April 6th and 7th, 1862. This is a fantastic resource. It can be used as a history of the battle and the campaign. It can also be used as a guide when you visit Shiloh. But there's another section in the back that has other recommendations for more books to read. And just, I'm gonna flip it real quick. This thing is filled up with illustrations, photographs, modern photographs of the field and maps. So you can really follow the battle step by step there. Um, and that one is by Gregory Mertz. So two great books that have come out recently that are just really good resources on the Battle of Shiloh. I think we got some questions, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Jeff and see what he's got for me there. All right, Richard, great job, man. Can you hear me? Just wanna make sure. Okay, well, first of all, let me say, that was a fantastic and interesting uh, talk, and I love how you take it from the individual all the way up through the ranks and show um, how our collection really features every part of the battle and every part of Civil War. Also, I wanna say, Man, that's a that's a pro speaker um, uh, talent you have for keeping your focus during the technical difficulties we had. <laughs> Many people on so the chat were, were just wanted very, to make sure everybody else could hear. We're very impressed by the way you were able to stay focused on that, but I think we got some of those technical all glitches. Right there, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, yeah, we do have a few questions before our lunch hour is over. Uh, first one is uh, from Ashley, and she asked, um, how can we learn more about uh, the Civil War flags in our collection? That is an excellent question. Uh, I was planning on pumping this a little bit here towards the end. Uh, the, the Tennessee State Museum, in partnership with the University of Tennessee Press, is publishing a major Civil War work called The Civil War Flags of Tennessee. Uh, this book will be out in late May. And you can actually go on to the University of Tennessee Press website now and pre-order yourself a copy. Uh, it is a labor of love. The book started about 20 years ago before I was even at the museum. It was originally going to be a coffee table book of uh, the flags in our collection. It then expanded to being every known Civil War flag that we could find in the state of Tennessee or even outside the state of Tennessee. So basically any flag that was associated with Tennessee during the Civil War. So you've got Union and Confederate flags that will be uh, represented in the book, garrison flags, battle flags, uh, personal Bible flags that people carried. Uh, the publication's coming in at 700 and something pages, and it will be color illustrated with photographs of the flag. So we are really looking forward to that. We think it's going to be a resource that will stand for years to come uh, with the flags that are associated with Tennessee. So be on the lookout for that towards late May. And if you want to go on UT Press's website, you can actually pre-order it now. Awesome, great. Uh, Larry Prophet asks, uh, in the in the flag, it looked like one of those stars were colored in. I'm not sure. He asked, was that star colored in purposefully or was that is that damage to the flag? Do you do you know yeah, that? To the flag. In fact, what you're seeing there mostly is the blue that's coming in from the back of the flag most of that star and i do apologize some of the images may not have been come through great but that's the bleed through color for the star that's missing and it, you would see there there's some been some reinforcement stitching on the flag around some of the stars to keep them from totally coming off the flag okay great i got my, i'm going to do two more questions before we wrap it up um lauren says thanks for an awesome talk uh, what is your favorite Civil War artifact in the State Museum's collection? That's a good one. Ooh, that is a good one. Um, can I list you about 10? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm a big music buff, too, and people always ask me, what's your favorite band? It's hard to limit that down to one there, but uh, I would say probably the one that is really my favorite and I have the most sort of connection to is in the Battle of Franklin case at the museum <clears throat> is the officer's kepi that Patrick Claiborne was wearing when he was killed at the Battle of Franklin. Uh, and it's a pretty fancy kepi with some ornamentation on the top. But the story goes that his troops used that kepi to cover his face when he was laid out with other Confederate officers on the back porch of Carnton Mansion. Um, 
The George Thomas sword, though, is is pretty neat too to think that he carried that as his personal sidearm uh, throughout the entire war. Um, so those, I guess, two. There's two. Those are two really big ones. And I'm also a huge fan of our flag collection. I've always been very interested in Civil War. Awesome. That's great. That's great. We, we're getting so many great questions here. Uh, uh, Richard, I'll share these questions with you after because we, we simply can't get them, get to them all. And maybe you can uh, uh, help some of our, our guests today with some of their questions, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, maybe, um, you know, um, we can uh, we can talk about how we're sure. Um, any questions. Yeah, there's one about the Rosser letter and uh, maybe uh, um, uh, getting a transcription as a primary source for our students who are all at home, uh, like mine in the next room over right now. So that's a great idea. Absolutely. And the Rosser letter, like I said, I kind of cut it up and I was really just talking about sort of what he was experiencing as an individual, not necessarily the regiment or the fighting. It's about a six page letter and he does, I mean, you can talk about the battle because he talks about his experience during the battle. It's a great letter, great letter. Yeah, yeah. Um, another question comes in, says uh, you mentioned that one of the generals did not use his family connections to move up in rank. Was that, was that common for soldiers to do that? Well, on different levels, yes. Uh, at the beginning of the war, and we were talking about Bate, uh, who had been a Tennessee politician, so he's a known entity within the state. And you had a lot of those people that petitioned the governor for command of a regiment or even to be made a general, command a brigade or a division. Uh, so early in the war, you've got the connection. The first guys that get popped up into those positions are former army officers. So guys who have been to West Point have been formally trained. Uh, but then you do have um, political generals, guys that get appointed because of the party they're in and their support is needed by a politician or you have uh, the connection of being a pretty prominent citizen, like Bate would have been. Uh, he had been involved in politics, has a rather good business. Uh, you know, Nathan Bedford Forrest is another one that he's basically a millionaire um, slave trader and plantation owner at the beginning of the war, but he enlists as a private. Now, of course, he pretty quickly bumps up in rank. So you did have some of these people that went in a private and they rise pretty quickly, but others, and especially you see the political connections in the Union Army that get people promoted rather quickly. So it's just different, you know, it works different for different people. Right, right. All right, well, great. Um, I'm seeing our time, we're running down on our time now. Uh, I know we've got a lot of other questions on there. Like I said, maybe we can work on a way that we can get uh, with our communications team and uh, maybe some uh, do some responding to those questions uh, through our through our social media channels and things like that. Um, but I think this is maybe a good time and place to uh, to leave it here for now. Uh, Richard, I want to say thank you so much again uh, for being our guinea pig. You you really set the standard for us, and uh, what a great presentation! Thank you so much. Thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate everybody that was here with us. All right. Well, thanks. And um, folks, for you all, thank you so much for tuning in uh, to our very first live stream. We're here uh, with you through this uh, through this uh, challenging time for us all, but we can still share and learn about Tennessee history. Next week, please take note of this. We'll have our next curator, and that's going to be Rob DeHart. He's going to talk to us uh, a little bit about uh, his former temporary exhibit called Let's Eat Origins and Evolutions of Tennessee Food. We're also going to have a special guest. We're going to have Erin Byers Murray. She's the author of Grits, a cultural and culinary journey throughout the South. And they're going to share a very uh, time appropriate topic. It's called Making Do, a history of Tennessee food when resources are scarce. I'm not sure if they're going to include toilet paper in that. Probably not. Uh, but uh, it is very appropriate for all of us today. So please join us back right here at 12 o'clock next Wednesday. Connect with us uh, throughout the rest of the week on our social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And we look forward to seeing you right back here next week. That's all we got for now. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.